this younger generation. Here's the thing. It almost looks like a video game and everything, doesn't it? And all the power and all, but they're sitting around playing games. Well, let me tell you something. This isn't a game. This is a real sword, and it really does work, and it is powerful, and it is mighty. And I am so excited to have Brother Edgar Reed come and share. He was an associate pastor here, wound up going on the mission field in Africa, and now is working with Bible Alliance and with the uh, life publishers and with the uh, getting the fire Bible and the fire Bible and Bible Alliance getting it out to the world and that that video is already out of date because he'll share with you how many Bibles there's not 40 something Bibles that God is multiplying and God is putting the word of the Lord out there and multitudes of people are being saved uh, one personal testimony uh, through Mercy House somebody got on our website a guy from Pakistan got on our website and said, is there any way you can help me get a Bible? I got a whole house full of people who are believers. We can't find any Bibles, and we saw this, and we just thought maybe y'all could help us. Well, they didn't know that I knew Edgar Reed and uh, that I called him, and he made some contacts, and Jimmy Dearman, and the next thing you know, they're online with him and talking with him, and he's got a stack of fire Bibles on his way, and we've got a beachhead established there in that area of Pakistan because God's Word is still alive and powerful. Amen? Amen. So Brother Edgar Reed is going to come and share for a few moments, then he's going to have to run out and hit the airport and take off to fly halfway around the world. Thank you, Brother Ron. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be home with family. I have to take care of a little bit of business, though. Last night, I made a deal with all the young people who worked the, uh, the supper and the meeting last night that if uh, they wanted a free fire Bible, all they had to do was copy the Psalms 119, hand copy it, and bring it in. I gave them till April the 1st. One young person sat last night and worked on it and brought it in this morning. And I'm looking for, let me put my glasses on. The old man now has to wear glasses, so sorry. Mine's still for reading, so. And I hope I say your name correctly, okay? Armoni? Where are you? Are you in here? Go get her, because she's got to get this. Isn't that great? She's working. Oh, really? Well, let me tell you about the Fire Bible, okay? That is out of date. We have 47 languages printed. <laughs> and released. And let me correct that. The Greek Fire Bible hasn't been delivered. It will be delivered next week. Hey, come here. Is that all I'm going to get to a handshake? I got to have a hug because I'm proud of you, brother. Thanks. Now listen. Now there, there's a problem with this, okay? As you begin to read it, it's going to burn in you. And pastor ain't going to be able to contain you in what you want to do for him and do for God, okay? God bless you. Thank you. Way to go. I love it when God stirs a heart. You see, that's what we're trying to do with the Fire Bible. As I was saying, the Greek has been, is on its way there. The Burmese reprint is coming out of India. We've been working to get it released again. The Vietnamese is being held up by the government because they've got to verify every page, and it can take one month, six months, one year. Don't know when it's going to be released. The Marnati and the Punjabi, the Punjabi, I just got in my office this Thursday, the first print copy. The rest of them are going to press. So every day it's changing of what God is doing, and it's because of you partnering. Now, the video also didn't, isn't up to date because when we released it, we thought we'll start with these languages and we'll see what happens. Well, then there's somebody gets a hold of it, and a couple of missionaries said, why aren't you doing it in Farsi? Why aren't you doing it in... Croatia, why aren't you doing it in Serbia? 
That's why I said this morning that missionary that was talking for BGMC was also one that requested, why can't we have it in Serbia? So you see, it's not stopping. It's caught on, and it's like a flamed fire. It's growing and going because when the Word gets in, it releases people to do things for Him, things that we call abnormal in the world, but in the spirit world, it is normal for God. Let me explain to you about Pakistan. There's a pastor by the name of Saeed. Pastor Saeed got his fire Bible, the Urdu fire Bible, less than four years ago, and God set him on fire, and he decided that God had told him to go plant a church. God blessed him with a little bitty Vespa. He and his wife and his child climbed on the Vespa. He's at the front. Baby's in the front here, standing, hanging on, hanging on to the handlebars. His wife, his pregnant wife is behind him, and they go and they minister in the church every Sunday. Last year, in May, a group of thugs stopped him on the way to church. They beat him up and they said, you can't go preach. You must deny this one you call Jesus. Saeed said, I cannot deny Christ. They said, if you come again next week, we'll kill you. The next Sunday, Saeed, during the week, Saeed called his superintendent and he said, Brother Hashemit, please pray for me. I'm still going in. The following Sunday, Saeed got to the same point. There was no one there. He thought he was free, but when he got to the meeting place, they were there. They shot and killed him. Hmm. End of story, right? <sighs> what Satan meant for bad became the best thing that's ever happened. He's in heaven. At his funeral, his wife stood and told why he was planning a church, how that as he read his fire Bible, that he began to study that if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you know Jesus as your Savior, you're to go tell everyone. He read Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, and he said, you got to go tell them what you know. And as his wife gave the testimony, she gave forth a plea. Who will replace him? Fifty young pastors stood up and accepted the call to go plant churches in difficult places, all because one young man got a hold of the Word, and the Word inspired him, and fifty young men have moved forward. The stories are multiplicated all over the world. There's a story of a fellow by the name of Muhammad. Muhammad lived in Kenya, and he decided that God called him to go out to one of the islands. It's a total Muslim island to plant a church. He gets there. He and his wife start meeting. Why did he do it? He said, because I learned that the Bible teaches us to be missionaries. He learned it from his Swahili fire Bible. He got to the island, and he said God told him to walk around the island, and he started walking and praying for everything, encircling his camp, claiming it for God. He got back to where they were, had the little hut built for meeting for church, and it was on the ground. He left it on the ground and cleared a space and still had church. The following week, the imam, the Muslim imam, the teacher, came and said, you will die before next time you have worship. Saeed continued on Sunday morning. He continued. On the way to the church that morning, there was a young boy who was lame in his feet and he was crawling. Saeed's devotional that day, and this, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Muhammad. Muhammad's devotional that day was about where Peter and John went to the temple and they met a young lame man and they said, Silver and gold have I none, but rise in the name of Jesus. And he said to him, rise up, my Savior heals you. Muhammad did not know. And it was later revealed because the imam came crawling to the church. The young boy was the imam's son. 
And he believed in Jesus, and he went leaping and screaming through the village. I've been healed. I've been healed by Yeshua. And the imam tried to beat him and stop him, and he said no. And the imam started walking toward the church to try to stop Muhammad. And God struck him down. And God said, you have to crawl and ask for forgiveness before I'll heal you. Island of Ziggenshore. There's a church in that village. All because a young man took the word and he believed. We're trying to take the word into Iran. We're trying to take the word because they don't get to carry around a Bible. Carrying a Bible means death. But if you put it on your phone and a little chip, and the chip is downloaded onto your phone, the police can't find it because it's set up like a special tool, and you have to know how to get into it. And it doesn't say it's a Bible, and everyone can have one. And each of your smartphones, the chips, the back of it will come off, and it'll hold 100 of them that can be smuggled in. Yeah. Can we count on you to help send the word? Word that will inspire souls change lives, change destiny of where they're going to spend eternity, change generations of those who've never seen or heard about the truth of Jesus. Jesus, Son of God. Jesus, coming back again. Jesus, my Savior. Jesus, all-powerful. Today's your day. You see, And I told this story last night. It's out of the Bible. It's in Samuel. Jonathan is going to go up on the garrison and take the enemy camp. He's inspired to do it. He turns to his armor bearer because they've got to climb straight up, which means there's no weapons in their hands. It's on the back of the armor bearer. And he turns to the armor bearer and he said, we're going up to defeat the garrison. I don't know that God will be with us but we're going. Will you go? You're in the place of the armor bearer today. Today's a challenge to do the digital. The armor bearer said, where you go, I go. You can count on me. Can we count on you today? This is your time to step up and say, and it's all throughout this year. Because you see, Putting God's words in the hands with the tools in the toolbox that they can understand what God is trying to say and inspire them that they can change the destiny of their nation. Can we count on you? Pastor, thank you. I am running out to the airport. I'm headed to Mozambique. I need your prayers. We're going to Mozambique. I've been there five times trying to talk to the Bible Society and to allow us to use the text to do the Bible in the Shangana language. I leave here at 110, and I'll land there tomorrow night about ooh, 11 o'clock. So, yeah, they don't make seats for fat boys. They don't make them for the long boys either. Thank you, Pastor. Love you. Love you, buddy. Love you. Very much. First of all, I want you to take the story out. I'll read it right quickly in case you didn't read it. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 12 months of rainfall in four. From May to August, the ground absorbs the rain and seeds begin to grow. And October and November are filled with celebration, singing and dancing. The season of harvest arrives and a luxurious two meals a day are provided each adult and child in the village. With December, grains begin to run low and many families skip breakfast to conserve food. When January comes, a new year does not bring new hope. 
The size of the one daily meal grows smaller in February. Sickness falls on many children in March as their immune systems are weakened from malnourishment. One half of a meal isn't enough. April is the most horrific month in the twilight uh, cries of hungry children rise up in the plains as most people are surviving with just an evening cup of gruel. One of Assemblies of God missionary recounts the inevitable story of a boy running to his, uh, to his father. Hurry, Dad, come with me. I found grain. There's a sack hanging up behind our home. Mommy can make dinner tonight and our tummies can be full. Son, we can't do that, the dad softly explains. That's next year's seed grain. It's, on, it's the only thing between us and starvation, and we're waiting for rain. Then we will plant it. That'd be tough, wouldn't it? Your children are hungry, and they want to eat, and they know there's a sack of grain there. In May, the rains finally arrive, and the young boy watches his father take the sack and do the most unreasonable thing imaginable. Instead of feeding his desperately weakened family, he goes to the field, and with tears streaming down his face, he scatters the precious seed in the dirt. Why? Because he believes in the harvest. In our day, God summons us to plant the gospel in all nations and generations. Indeed, the gospel can grow in the driest of soil. I want to talk to you this morning about precious seed. This gospel of Jesus Christ that we take for granted, our churches and our homes are full of dusty Bibles. But yet in so much of the world, they do not have access to God's word. They don't have a whole Bible. Many only have a couple of chapters or maybe one book of the Bible. And yet people are trying to pastor. And you just heard several stories where someone confronted with the fullness of God's word began to become all that God intended for them to be. It tells us in uh, Psalm 126 and verse 5 and 6, he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him. Maybe this story gives you a little more understanding of what that passage is talking about. Another version, the New Living Testament says in verse 5 and 6, those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. I want you to know that in this nation, we have a lot of seed. Many of you have a little bit of the word of God in you and just a little bit of the, just one seed. Some of you may remember the Sunday where I did the corn example and how that one, one particular piece of corn can be planted which will create a stalk of corn and then each stalk has multiple ears which has hundreds of kernels of corn. And then if you take that stalk with all of its kernels and you plant it, and we showed you that in just two, row, two or three rotations, you could take a little stack of corn right here and that corn could fill tractor trailer loads of corn. That's the harvest. But we have so much of God's word that is in us, so much of God's word that is sitting around us, and it is not being put in the soil. If it's not being put in the soil, it cannot bear fruit. But as we understand that we bear precious seed, you bear precious seed in you. It is in your heart. It is in your mind. You need to speak it forth to those who are hungry. I think about India, and I think about Mahatma Gandhi. And how that he was a man who looked at the suffering of his nation, the nation of India. Calcutta is a, is a city, I forget how many, like 13 million people. And guess what? It's no bigger than the city limits of Jackson. Not the suburbs, just the city limits of Jackson. We have about 110,000, 105, 110,000 people in the city of Jackson. Imagine 13 million people living in the same space. That nation is starving. In certain areas of that nation in Calcutta and other places, as we have garbage trucks, they have body trucks. They travel through the streets and the poor have no way, no place, no means to bury their dead. They will simply wrap them in whatever they can find, if they have any cloth or whatever, and literally lay them out beside the curb for trucks to come and pick up the bodies. 
because of the poverty, the starvation, the everything that is happening in that nation. And Mahatma Gandhi said there are people in the world so hungry that God cannot appear to them except in the form of bread. We're not talking about literal physical bread though. We're talking about a spiritual bread. Someone else who worked there in India was Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa ministered to the poor. We have an equal uh, type of person in uh, Mission of Mercy. The Buntains who went there to Calcutta and established a hospital down in the midst of Calcutta in its poorest section. You need to understand that in India there's a caste system and if you're a part of the outcast, they consider that to be your punishment. So they do nothing to help the outcast. They can die right in front of them. They feel no responsibility because they believe that's their karma. That's their punishment for something they've done in the past. So the poor starve. And those who are the outcast can be abused by people without any fear of repercussion because they are as if they don't even matter. They're under punishment. And the gospel is flourishing among these people because they're excited to hear the news that you not only matter, you are loved and that the God of the universe sent his son to die for you. And that glorious message comes and brings hope. And even Mother Teresa said people are hungry for something more beautiful, for something greater than people around them can give. And she certainly spoke out of true experience there in India. There is a great hunger for God in the world today and everywhere there is much suffering. But there is also greater hunger for God and love for each other. There is a spiritual hunger that even physical food cannot satisfy. There are people who hunger. In so much of the world, you remember the Sunday where we showed the video about the missionary who shared a letter that he had received from another missionary about the lady standing by the river Ganges? And how that she had thrown her little baby into the river because her husband was sick and she knew that she had many sins. And she was praying that the river Ganges, the goddess Ganges would forgive her and subsequently heal her husband. She gave the best that she could give. She threw her six month old baby into the river and sacrificed it to goddess Ganges in hopes. You see the thing is that I'm going to be preaching next Sunday about this. Within America, we've gotten to the place where we said, I don't, I don't have any responsibility to anyone but myself. I don't have any accountability to anyone or anything. There are no absolutes. There are no absolute rights and wrongs. There is no God. I'm accountable to no one. I'm only accountable to myself. And you can't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. And if no one can tell me that it's wrong, then there's no, there's no foul. So I have no guilt. I have no shame. I have no responsibility. I have no accountability. I am autonomous in my morality and in everything and so here in America, we are, we are being fed this lie that goes all the way back to the garden. Let me tell you something. Satan tried to convince Adam and Eve, and he, and he convinced them that they could eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and at that point they would be like God. They wouldn't be held accountable to God. They would be like God. They would be gods themselves. But guess what? After they ate of the fruit, what happened? They saw their nakedness. They realized their wickedness, and they were hiding. And guess what? God still came and God still held them accountable. I've got news for America. I don't care whether you think you're autonomous. You're not. And there's a God that all of us are going to be accountable to. I'm going to be preaching about that next week. But in much of the world, there was a spiritual hunger. They know there's a God. It's evident. Look, they live in nature. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 that nature itself gives evidence of the fact that there has to be a God. And I could go into that. I don't have time. There's a God. And they know that. And they know they're held accountable by this God. But they know him by all different kinds of names that they don't understand. And they're so excited to hear. And this lady, couldn't you have just come 30 minutes earlier to tell me? And I would not have had to give my son to the river Ganges. There's a message that you and I have. And we are the hope. We are the hope. You're the light in the darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless because you have the word of God. But I, I want to bring this down and I know I'm moving very quickly because the hour is late and I, I, I don't want to hold this up but I know we've had a lot of things happening this morning. But I want, I'm, I'm, I'm about to put a picture up here that may be upsetting to some of you. But I believe it depicts to me and to you where so many people are within the kingdom of God. 
I, I, I love missionaries. I love stories of winning people to Jesus Christ. I actually, I, I mean, I love to hear stories where we've gone out and we've witnessed to someone and we've told them about Jesus Christ and they believed and accepted the Lord as their personal Savior. Nothing excites me more than that. But there has to be something beyond that. Why, why am I so animate about the fact that I want to put Bibles in the hands of pastors? It's because once born, if a child is not fed, First Peter chapter two, verses two through three says, "Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. The problem is, this picture depicts many Christians. I remember one time there was a liberal do, having an argument with a conservative on one of the talk radios. And, and, and what he said, this liberal, it really, it really stuck in my mind, in my spirit. And this person who was arguing that was a conservative was arguing for pro-life. And that we shouldn't be com committing murder and killing babies with abortions. And then this liberal said something. He said, you people are pro-birth, not pro-life. Because once they're born, you feel no responsibility after that. Something about that smacked in my spirit. It kind of hit me. And there's some truth to it. I believe that we go out many times and we, we give the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give the message. We are even guilty of it in the church. We will get people to come forward to to pray a prayer of confession of their sins and accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But then we do not disciple them beyond that point. We do not give them the food to sustain them, to grow them, and to mature them. These children here, it's not that they're not born. They're born. But if they don't get nourishment, they're going to die. And spiritually, hang with it. Some of you are already preaching my sermon. You're already ahead of me. You've seen a lot of people who come in, they get saved, and then before long they just kind of fade away and they disappear and they die. Why? Because you can't just birth them, you've got to feed them. Any of you know when you've got a little baby and that baby is born, that baby needs to be hungry. And a baby that doesn't want to eat, a baby that won't eat, man, all the bells and whistles go off, all the alarms go off, everybody goes crazy. Why? They know that baby has to eat if that baby is going to survive. So the word of God is very important. Jesus even said, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus said, Look, this word, it is life. He said, I am the bread of life. But what was he? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Then the word came and dwelt among us. He was the living word. This is the written word, the expression of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need the bread of heaven the living word and the written word to pour into our hearts and to give us life and to give us growth and maturity. But there are many of us who are like these little children. We're barely alive. A well-read Bible is a sign of a well-fed soul. I'll tell you what, if you get into this word, you begin to read this word. It's like this father. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing in missions work so many times in the past. We're eating the seed corn. We're eating the seed. We go out and we declare the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. It's kind of like we love that romantic picture of people going out to villages somewhere where they've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching the word of Jesus to them, praying with them to believe the Lord and to be saved. And that's exciting and that is wonderful and we need to do that. But, but many missionaries will tell you, and some of the missionaries like Brother Schultz and uh, Brother Morris Plotz and some of these old timers that, that we grew up knowing, they've all passed on, they're all gone to be with the Lord. Many of them being the first white person to go to many of the, the villages there in Africa and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. But then they would come back later and they would find that they were still carrying on many of their heathen practices because they knew that Jesus was the Messiah I remember one missionary telling about, he asked the chief, he said, how have you been doing? He says, I've been doing well. 
He says, how's your wife? He said, oh, I threw her out because she didn't have any children and I threw her out and I have another wife now. And he goes, you can't do that. He said, no one told me I couldn't do that. One of the other missionaries went to a, went to a village and one of the main people, his wife had given birth to twins and they took one of the twins and smashed its head against the tree because you don't do that. That's, that's, that's voodoo. That's bad to have twins. So you choose one of them. You save that when you kill the other because that's bad. Why? They didn't know any difference. They didn't know. But if we can put the Word of God within the hands of pastors, within the hands of believers, then they can grow themselves and mature themselves in the Lord and we can ensure the seed for coming generations. This word is powerful. Do you realize what people, what price people have paid for this? If you've never read Fox's book of martyrs, you need to read it. I'll tell you today, I believe that people like John Huss and Wycliffe, John Wycliffe would be, I believe they're dancing around in heaven. I know they're so excited because they fought for the word of God to be put in the everyday languages where people like you and, and me, you and I could read the word of God because it was written in Latin and only the priest could handle it. No one could have it. And they were killed because they wanted to take the word of God and give it to the common man to read. And what's interesting to me, I don't understand that because the living word came and walked among the common. And the common man is the one who wrote the words that the priests say only they're capable of handling. Y'all need to think through that one again. The common man that Jesus walked with is the men who wrote the word of God and the prophets of old. And then the priests say, oh, no, we're, only, you know, we're the only ones that can handle that. Well, the guys who wrote it were men who walked and talked with Jesus. So this word is powerful. This word can do incredible things. It does save, but it needs more than to save to transform. As I begin to understand, how do I understand about God? I'll tell you how I understand about God. By reading his word. And reading all the nuances and all the understandings about God. There are some of you in this place. I want to tell you there are some of you in this place right now. That's where you are. You're just barely saved. You're barely alive. And let me tell you something. If you don't mature, if you don't grow, if you don't start feeding yourself something. Guys from Mercy House, we tell you when you get out. You've got to continue to feed yourself the word of God. Why? You'll starve spiritually and perish and die. You've got to keep feeding your spirit. You know your spirit has to be fed. You have to let the Holy Spirit flow in and feed your spirit or your spirit will wither up and die. So what are you doing? This year God has so stirred me to challenge us. What are you doing to deepen your relationship with God? What are you doing to, to broaden your understanding? What are you doing to mature yourself? Because if you don't, this is how you're going to live your whole spiritual existence. Just barely alive. Just barely surviving. And the sad part is, as you look at some of the children, if you look at the one on the right, how his little belly is all swelled out. And I've had people say, well, they don't look like they're hungry to me. Look, look how their belly's all sticking out. Do you know why it's sticking out? It's because the bacteria have died in their intestines. And they're swelled. And, and there comes a point where you can give them food and it won't matter. They're going to die anyway. Because their, their intestines have died and they no longer have the ability to process food in their body. And they're the walking dead. And I'm afraid that there are people in the church who are the walking dead. It's just a matter of time. They've so starved their spirit. They've so starved themselves. But, but this morning, that's for next week, I've got some, a strong message for us to speak to us and about this nation and where we're headed and why we're in the mess we're in. But friends, this morning I challenge you. Along with that slip, you have this envelope. And what I want you to do is I want you to pray and I want you to ask God what you could do. Let me tell you, if you're here and you don't have a Bible, come see me. We will get you a Bible. There's not a person in this place, if you don't have a Bible, that couldn't get a Bible today. I will get you a Bible. I will make sure you have a Bible. We will get one into your hands. But there are people in the world 
There's not even one available. Like this man in Pakistan. I want one. I will buy one. I'm not asking anyone to give it to me. I'll be glad, I'll be glad to pay for it. They're just not here to purchase. But you and I have the opportunity to put this word within the hands of individuals and more particularly a cry of my heart to put this within the hands of pastors around the world so that they can ensure that there's not only seed but also bread in the future for the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. What can you do? You say, well, Pastor, I, I, $5 is all I give. $5 a Bible, an electronic Bible. $5. And here's the exciting part. I saw, I saw a cartoon this past week. As our musicians, if you would come. And it was showing Billy Graham standing at the gates of heaven. And the Lord was standing there and he said, there's a few people who are waiting to tell you thank you. And on the back side of the gates was a multitude as far as you could see. I'm going to let you in on something. Your $5 might be the $5 that sends a Bible to a particular person. That God so transforms their life that they, like this young man, go and be a witness that then multiplies into 50 pastors and then